Hey, it's Matt from Universal CPA Review. Thanks for checking out this video where we're gonna go through an example simulation on current expected credit losses. So if you're not familiar with the topic, it deals with impairment of debt securities that are classified as available for sale or held to maturity. Very difficult topic. It is being seen on the FAR section of the CPA exam, right? So this is a great video to watch before your exam. Now, real quick, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. If you haven't yet started a trial on the Universal course, feel free to do so. You'll have full access for seven days. Uh, please join our Facebook study groups. And then lastly, reach out to us with uh, any questions about current promotions or discounts. We want to help you get there and let's do this, right? So let's dive into the simulation video and let's get going. This is the moment you've been waiting for. You watched the lecture, you practiced the multiple choice questions, and now it's time to test your knowledge on current expected credit losses with this difficult simulation. So what are we gonna do in this video? Well, we're gonna quickly run through the instructions so that we make sure we understand them. We're gonna briefly review the exhibits so that we know what information we have, and then what are we gonna do? We're gonna destroy this simulation and go through every step and make sure that you fully understand how to tackle these types of questions, all right? So are we ready? So the company we're focused on is Block AI, and they're a blockchain company, and they're headquartered here in the United States, but they do have international operations. Now they made some investments and they purchased several debt securities, most likely bonds, right? And those are listed in column A. Now what we need to do for these debt securities is perform an impairment analysis. And under US GAAP, that means we have to use the current expected credit loss model, right? Other known as CECL, right? CECL is our favorite friend here. And so what we're gonna do for each of these is we're gonna review the exhibits, right? Get the relevant information. And then in column B, we need to put in the expected credit loss. In column C, we would report the credit loss that goes into earnings, which is the income statement. And then in column D, if we do have any unrealized gains or losses, we need to put that into other comprehensive income. Now, all dollar amounts are gonna be rounded to the nearest whole number. And also what we need to know is that anything that is a negative is a loss, right? So if we have a credit loss or expected credit loss or an unrealized loss, that's a negative number. If it's a gain, that's gonna be a positive number, right? And if there's no entry needed, well, we still need to put a zero. So very important to understand the instructions. So what I recommend is after you read the instructions, just do a quick peek at each of the exhibits. We don't need to know everything that's in there, but we wanna have a general idea of what is provided so that when we go through the questions, right, we think, okay, this is the information I think I need. Do I remember seeing it, right? and then you know where to go. All right, so let's go through the exhibits. So the first one is just present value factors. And why is that relevant? Well, as part of the uh, CECL model, we need to calculate the present value of future cash flows on each of these bond investments. And then the next four exhibits are actually memos written by Block AI that provide relevant information for each of these uh, bond securities. And basically, we can see that it provides us either with the amortized cost, um, the present value of future cash flows. In some cases, we might have to calculate. It also provides us the fair value, right? So that's information we're going to need. So as we go through each security, we'll bring up the relevant memo. So before we dive in and attack the simulation, let's quickly recap on the four-step approach for the CECL model, right? Because we are going to perform these four steps uh, for each of the securities. Um, so basically, we need to calculate the present value of future cash flows. Then we'll calculate the expected credit loss by comparing the present value of future cash flows to the amortized cost. And that gives us our expected credit loss. And then we'll calculate the fair value uh, relative to the amortized cost. And that will represent our total loss. And then we can figure out, okay, what amount of that loss is going to credit loss and what amount of loss or gain is going to other comprehensive income. And then we'll also have the journal entry because we do need to know those journal entries, even though we don't need to put them in for this simulation. 
So let's start with Summit Corp. So basically, um, they've classified this corporate bond that was issued by Summit Corp as available for sale, right? So that's the first piece of information we know. And then they went ahead and they performed uh, you know, their impairment analysis by looking at historical conditions, current conditions, and future expectations, right? So they did their job there. Now, what we really want is this information about the bond at December 31st, year five, right? And we see we have present value, future cash flows, amortized cost, and fair value. So that's the information we need. So let's start going through our four steps. So our first step is to identify the present value of future cash flows. And they tell us that it's 220,000, right? So not too tough. So let's move to step two. Now in step two, we'll take the present value of future cash flows, which is 220,000, and we'll subtract the amortized costs of 231,000. And that tells us the expected credit loss is 11,000. So basically this means that they're not gonna receive enough cash based on their expectations to meet what the amortized cost is, right? So when that's the case, that looks like more like a permanent loss and that is why it represents our expected credit loss. But we can't quite call that our credit loss yet because we need to look at the fair value. So in step three, we'll take the fair value of 180,000, subtract the amortized cost of 231,000. And wow, that tells us that the fair value is $51,000 below the amortized cost, right? So that is not good. So what we know, right, is the expected credit loss from the calculation in step two was 11,000. So that means 11,000 will go to credit loss and then the remaining 40,000 of, you know, that dip in fair value, that is gonna be considered an unrealized loss and that's gonna be recorded to other comprehensive income, right? So that's how we capture the total $51,000 decline in fair value, right? 11,000 is a credit loss, and then the remaining 40,000 is considered to be unrealized loss, and that's going to other comprehensive income. So when we think about the journal entry, well, to record the credit loss, we would debit credit loss for 11,000, and then the offsetting credit is to allowance for credit losses for 11,000. Now for the unrealized loss that's going to OCI, well, we would debit that account for 40,000 and then credit valuation allowance on that AFS investment for 40,000, right? So that's the full journal entry. But when we look back to our table, ultimately all we need to know is that the expected credit loss is 11,000, right? So a negative 11,000. The credit loss in earnings, which is gonna hit the income statement, again, that's a negative 11,000. And then for the impact to other comprehensive income, that's going to be a loss for negative 40,000, right? It's unrealized. So that's why it's an OCI. So that's Summit Corp. We've got the first one knocked out. So the next row, uh, the debt security relates to Cliff Corp. So when we bring up the memo, we read uh, that it, again, is a corporate bond. And they've classified this one as available for sale as well. Now, the coupon rate on this bond is 4% and it pays interest annually at the end of each period. Now, they did the same sort of uh, analysis on the historical conditions, current conditions, and future expectations. Now, again, what we really care about is the amortized cost and fair value, but where's the present value of future cash flows? Well, unfortunately, we're gonna have to calculate that here. Now, they do tell us the estimated cash flows for the next two years before uh, the bond reaches maturity, right? So in year six, we're gonna get that interest payment of 2,900, and in year seven, we'll get the interest payment of 2,000 plus the principal repayment of 55,000, right? So if we have that information, we know the coupon rate is 4%, then we can go ahead and grab those present value factors and calculate it ourselves. So let's do it. So as you can see in step one, I've broken up cash flow into both years six and seven, right? So if we're at the end of year five, that means year six is gonna be one period away and year seven will be two periods away, right? So if we go to our present value uh, factor table and we go to 4%, well, we're gonna need 4% for one year, which is year six, and then for two periods, which is for year seven, right? So you can see I've plugged in those figures and when we multiply them by the cash flow, well, 
Present value adjusted for year six is 2,788, and then year seven is 52,700, right? And those are both rounded. And then when we add them together, the sum for year six and seven, which becomes the present value of future cash flows, is $55,488. So now that we have the present value of future cash flows for this bond for the next two years until maturity, well, we have the information to calculate step two. So we take the present value of future cash flows of 55,488, subtract the amortized cost of 76,000, and wow, that's an expected credit loss of 20,512, right? Now that's not necessarily gonna make its way to the income statement, but we will figure out what amount will in step three. So when we look at the fair value, right? Because the fair value for an AFS security, that means they could ultimately sell today and they might not recognize any credit loss. But unfortunately, the fair value is 68,000, which is still below the amortized cost of 76,000. So that means we have a total loss and a credit loss limit of 8,000, right? So that means that expected credit loss of 20,512 well, it's gonna be limited to the 8,000 here because again, we cannot drop below that fair value because they could go sell it, right? So when we look at step four, the impact OCI, well, our total loss was 8,000 and our credit loss is 8,000, right? So nothing is going to OCI. So for the final journal entry, well, all they need to do is debit credit loss for 8,000 and then credit allowance for credit losses for 8,000. Now in our, um, Simulation here, well, we're gonna enter in expected credit losses, that 20,512, it's a negative number. In our credit loss, we'll enter negative 8,000. But then in other comprehensive income, there is no impact, right? So it's gonna be zero. So now we can move on to our third debt security, which was issued by Granite Point. And again, when we bring up the memo, it's a corporate bond and it's classified as available for sale. Now it gives us the same information, um, but looks like we have the amortized cost, present value of future cash flows, and the fair value. So let's dive into step one. So the present value of cash flows, again, it's provided, it's 330,000. So in step two, when we take that number, subtract the amortized cost, well, we have an expected credit loss of $10,000. But we're not ready to record that yet, right? So in step three, this is the credit loss limit. Now, what's interesting here is that the fair value is 375,000 and the amortized cost is 340,000, right? So they actually have a gain here of 35,000. All right, so when we think about what to record, well, that gain is an unrealized gain. It's going to other comprehensive income. We don't have any credit loss, right? So no impact of the income statement. And that basically means that full 35,000 would be recorded, right? So what's the journal entry? but well, we need to increase the value of this AFS debt security by debiting that account for 35,000. And then our credit is to unrealized gain on available for sale, which is other comprehensive income for that same 35,000, right? So in this one, the fair value is much higher than the amortized cost, which is a good thing for block AI. Now in our simulation table, our expected credit loss is gonna be negative 10,000 right? But then our credit loss and earnings is zero. And in other comprehensive income, since we have an unrealized game, it's going to be positive 35,000, right? So this one is very different in the sense that we have no credit losses and we actually have a gain that's hitting other comprehensive income. So our last debt security here was issued by Elevate Corp. So let's bring up the memo. And this one starts off the same. It's again, it's a corporate bond, but they plan to hold it to maturity and they've classified it as such. Now, again, they did some similar analysis by looking at historical conditions, current conditions, blah, 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 right? But we have the information that we need. That's the amortized cost and the present value of future cash flows. Now, it also gives us the fair value, but because it's held to maturity, we don't care about that, right? Fair value is not a consideration. We don't really record unrealized gains and losses for held to maturity, right? So that's just an extra data point that we ultimately don't need. So for a held to maturity security under the Cecil model, we really only need those first two steps. Unfortunately, step one's easy. The present value of cash flows is 150,000. 
All right, so in step two, when we compare that to the amortized cost, that results in an expected credit loss of 23,000, and that's not good for block AI. That means they're gonna have to uh, basically write down uh, this asset with its credit loss, right? So how would they record uh, the journal entry? Well, it would be a debit for credit loss uh, for 23,000 and then allowance for credit losses for 23,000 as well, right? So um, again, no consideration of fair value here uh, because they plan to hold it till maturity. So it ultimately um, is really just focused on what amount of cash are they gonna receive on a present value adjusted basis uh, over the remaining uh, you know, holding period, right? So in our simulation here in the table, the expected credit loss is negative 23,000. The credit loss in earnings is negative 23,000 and no impact to other comprehensive income, right? That's gonna be a zero. So that's our simulation, very, very difficult. Uh, we went through four different scenarios for debt securities when applying the CECL model, right? So be very familiar. Hopefully by now, this stuff is second nature and you feel good about it.